Hello friends, today we'll uh, discuss the current affairs for the 3rd of uh, Ma- April 2022. Now the first topic that we'll discuss is uh, FASTER. It's a new scheme that has been introduced uh, by the Supreme Court in order to... Uh, what? So this new scheme is introduced by the Supreme Court in order to ensure that uh, the verdicts of the Supreme Court are uh, sent in time to the authorities, relevant authorities, and uh, hence the authorities can act in due time. Uh, the second uh, topic that we'll discuss is with regards to Nepal's Prime Minister visiting India. It will be his uh, fifth visit since he assumed power, and the rebuilding of relations between Nepal and India ever since the border row erupted, and uh, there was a lot of worsening of relations back then. Since then, uh, India-Nepal relations have revived, so we'll talk about that. Also, India and Australia, this is the biggest news of the day, that India and Australia have managed to sign a new trade deal, under which it is believed that the bilateral trade between both the countries will double in the next five years, and it will reach around $50 billion. Okay. So the rest of the topics are pretty straightforward. Uh, The other topic that we can discuss a little in detail is with regards to CBI's losing autonomy. Now, moving on the first topic, faster. Faster is nothing but fast and secure transmission of electronic records. The Chief Justice of India launched the digital platform Fast and Secure Transmission of Electronic Records. Now, what is this platform? The platform will be used for court officials to install, to instantly send e-copies of the orders through a secured electronic communication channel to intended parties, thus ensuring that judicial orders can be communicated quickly. So till now, usually it is such that the judicial orders are sent in a physical format. And uh, since they are sent in a physical format, there is a lot of duplication and uh, there is a lot of delay. Also uh, duplication and also modification of the actual award of the court. And hence it was uh, resulting in a lot of issues. So now this faster uh, platform will ensure that e-copies of the verdicts, e-copies of the verdicts are sent very fast to the jail authorities or the other authorities. So that depending upon the verdict, either the person can be released or he can be detained, etc. We don't need to wait for the hard copy of the verdict. Through the use of the software, orders that were passed by the High Courts and the Supreme Court will be transmitted safely without any third-party interference. Bail orders will be communicated via faster and for authentication purposes, it will also have the digital signature of the notified nodal officers of the Supreme Court as well as the institutional digital signatures. Both the signature of the officer, I mean the signature of the nodal officer and also the signature of the institution. In this manner, without much loss of time, bail orders would be received by all the concerned parties and quick necessary actions will be taken at their end. What is the need for such a system? There have been cases in the past where inmates were not released by the prison authorities despite bail orders being passed by the court. As the certified hard copies of the bail orders reach the prison late. So because of this, these inmates, they were kept in prison. Now say for example, if at all, uh, the verdict comes out on a Friday and uh, the verdict has not reached the jail authorities within time then uh, since the weekend is a holiday okay since the weekend is a holiday uh, at the jail in terms of releasing prisoners the person will have to spend two days in jail even though he has gotten bail okay so thus for a smooth transmission of the court's orders and effective implementation of article 21 such a system was the need of the hour it will also ensure that under trials, who are under trials? Under trials are people who are still under trial. They have not been convicted of the case and uh, they are still under the proceedings of the court. It will ensure that under trials are not made to wait for days on end behind bars to be released uh, because the certified hard copies of their bail orders took time to reach the prison. It will also prevent unnecessary arrests and custody of people even after the court has already granted them its protection. Okay, so thus it will reduce a lot of injustice that is being done. 
and this is the reason why this was introduced okay faster scheme was introduced by the supreme court next news nepal becomes the fourth country to implement rupee now what is the news okay i told you that recently the nepal pm has visited india and the indian pm and the nepali pm they have had a summit level meeting at the summit level meeting there were different decisions related to railways taken decisions related to power energy decisions related to financial transactions such as rupee etc okay now under this rupee uh, under this uh, deal nepal became the fourth foreign country to operationalize the rupee card with prime minister modi and his nepali counterpart pm sher bahadur duba jointly launching the indian electronic payment system in the himalayan nation so now from now on you can also go ahead and use the rupee card not just in india but also in nepal so nepal becomes the fourth country after bhutan and after uh, singapore and uh, uae okay it becomes the fourth country to introduce rupee now what is rupee okay rupee if i have to give an analogy it is very similar to visa and master card so what it does is that whenever these banks uh issue cards based on rupee okay rupee verifies the transaction it ensures that this transaction is happening through a proper full proof mechanism and there is no duplication of the transaction there is no forfeiting of the transaction okay there is no fake transaction so it is the job of rupee to ensure that it is a legitimate transaction that happens just like what visa and mastercard do they provide security for the transaction so that the details of the transaction do not get leaked and the details of the card holders do not get leaked okay no rupee is the first of its kind domestic card payment network of india with wide acceptance at atms point of sale devices and e-commerce websites across india it is highly secure network that protects against anti phishing rupee is an initiative of the npci please remember it is an initiative of the national payments corporation of india this is a company okay now uh, so rupee was launched under the payment and settlement systems act okay so some of the benefits of the rupee cards are data of consumers and all the transactions pertaining to the rupee card are secured okay it ensures safe transactions with sms alerts and notifications that are sent out to the customer's phone number after every transaction rupee card holders can be ensured of a secure transaction there is also a greater reach because of usage of rupee cards because rupee card was associated with jandan accounts so all the people who had opened their account under the jandan scheme they were given rupee cards so they were given rupee cards okay hence consumers in rural areas can also easily apply and get a rupee card it also costs lesser transaction fees okay why because when it comes to rupee card transactions all the processing happens within india itself there is no need to ensure that transactions happen abroad and because this transaction handling fees is lower in india it ensures that it costs lesser transaction costs okay so thus the settlement costs and clearing costs are lower and hence rupee uh, debit card or credit card is cheaper to use banks will profit immensely from this as costs of transactions processing becomes affordable okay also payment solutions across platforms rupee debit card is designed to provide complete interoper- interoperability between payment channels including mobile technology atms checks etc it is suitable for indian customers why because rupee cards have been customized keeping in mind the product and service requirements of the indian customers unlike visa and mastercard which have not been designed in particular for 
Indian customers. So, and one more additional benefit of the rupee cards is that it provides accidental insurance. Okay. All rupee ATM come debit card holders are presently eligible for accidental death and permanent disability related insurance. Okay. Not just accidental death, but also permanent disability related insurance is available under the rupee card. If you own a rupee card, automatically you get insurance benefits. Okay, now moving on to the most important topic. Uh, also, uh, since we are discussing about India and Nepal over here, we'll also discuss about uh, what has happened between India and Nepal and why India and Nepal relations have gotten so bad. And now why, how are they reviving? In 2015, uh, in Nepal, after the earthquake happened, Nepal tried to introduce a new constitution. But this new constitution that Nepal had introduced was not favorable to the favorable to India. Okay. So India engineered a blockade of goods to Nepal. And you know that since Nepal is a landlocked country, if India institutes a blockade of goods to Nepal, all the prices of essential commodities will increase. Okay, so because India was holding Nepal to ransom, this uh, turned against India. Okay, this was one of the first incidents. After this, the, the most major incident was related to maps and uh, areas of conflict. Okay. Nepal claims that Kalapani Kalapani uh, Limpiadura and Lipu Lake Limpiadura and Lipu Lake all of them are a part of Nepal however all these form a part of the Indian state of Uttarakhand according to India what happened was that in the Nepalese parliament maps which showed these areas to be a part of Nepal were also published and this is a big problem. Also, politicians in Nepal, they try to, uh, you know, exploit anti-Indianism because of these incidents. Nepali politicians, they try to show, show that, you know, India is trying to act like a big brother in Nepal. Okay. So, because of the political angle also, it, it was uh, causing a problem. Also, China has been making excessive inroads into Nepal. Okay, China has maintained a link with uh, all of them. It has maintained a link with the kings of Nepal. It has maintained a link with the elected people of Nepal. So, increasing Chinese presence in Nepal is also alienating people away from India. Okay, now... There are also several other issues. Uh, one of it is related to Indian hydropower procurement because India tries to procure hydropower at a cheap price. And also Indian projects, okay, uh, Arun 3 project in particular, has not been completed for a very long time. Uh, and this does not go down well with Nepal. That in India is failing on its project deliverables. And India is uh, procuring hydropower at a cheaper cost. Okay. So there are several issues. Now, moving on. India-Australia deal seeks to double bilateral trade in five years. Now, currently India-Australia trade lies somewhere between 20 to 25 billion dollars. Okay. With India's imports being higher. India's imports are around, say, 15, 16 billion dollars. And India's exports are just about uh, 6 to 7 billion dollars. Okay. So, uh, India and Australia signed an economic cooperation and trade agreement. I'm sorry. Economic cooperation and trade agreement on uh, Saturday in the presence of Prime Minister Modi and his counterpart. Scott Morrison with an aim on doubling the bilateral trade to 50 billion dollars in just five years. Okay, easing the movement of people, goods and services across the borders. Now, why is the deal important? It is not just important from economy standpoint. It is also very important from strategic space. 
statistic space in the sense that it will ensure the formation of a block or a grouping of India and Australia so that they can act together in the Indo-Pacific region and can keep Chinese domination away. The deal will increase resilience of the supply chains and also contribute to the stability of the Indo-Pacific region. The trade agreement is expected to double the goods and the bilateral trade. The deal will facilitate work visas for two to four years for Indian students in Australia on a reciprocal basis and allow Indian chefs and yoga professionals to work in that country. The trade and economic partnership deal with Australia, which is in the middle of a trade battle with China, a significant milestone at a time when the developed world is looking to hedge its supply chain dependence. So because of the Western world being dependent on China, China is weaponizing this supply chains. Okay, if you remember some time back when Australia criticized China for, uh, you know, actions against Uyghur Muslims. Uh, China responded back by increasing customs duty on Australian imports and thus China holds a very strong control of uh, uh, how Australia should act and it is trying to dictate terms to the Australian country I mean to the Australian government which is not liked by Australia hence because Australia wants to come out of this it is trying to reduce its dependence on China and it is trying to move over to other countries such as India now, what are the components of this new deal, this economic cooperation and trade agreement? What are the components of it? It encompasses cooperation across the entire gamut of bilateral economic and commercial relations, such as it ensures, I mean, it talks about trade in goods, trade in services, rules of origin, technical barriers to trade, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, dispute settlement, movement of natural persons, customs procedures, and the cooperation in other areas therefore this deal is a very holistic deal it covers most of the components related to trade okay with regards to compulsory review mechanism there will be a special review mechanism for compulsory review after 15 years for certain aspects of the agreement in a time bound manner hence after 15 years there will be a review of the deal if it's working out as planned or not okay Australia will provide zero access duty to 96% of India's exports. Such a, uh, what, which exports? Engineering goods, gems, jewellery, textiles, apparel and leather. While India will provide 85% of Australia's exports, zero duty access. Okay, including coal, sheep meat, wool and lower duty access on Australian wines, almonds, lentils etc. Okay. So while around 96% of India's exports have zero duty uh, on their imported to Australia, similarly 80, 85% of Australia's exports will have zero duty import uh, access in India. Okay, This also ensures that there are cheaper raw materials which are provided to India. Australian exports are more concentrated in raw materials, we just saw. Many industries in India will get cheaper raw materials and make them competitive in particular for sectors like steel, aluminium, garments. Okay, So these cheap raw materials will make these industries more effective. Service sector benefits. In the services sector, benefits for India include post-study work visa of 2-4 to four years for Indian students on a reciprocal basis. There is also easier movement of people as work and holiday visa arrangement for young professionals will be eased. Okay, the new deal also eliminates double taxation, which means that all the Indian companies which are working in Australia, okay, uh, they shall not be taxed again. Thus, it, it shall not happen that they are taxed twice. So, Australia has also agreed to amend its domestic tax laws to stop the taxation of offshore income of Indian firms providing technical services in Australia. Okay. Next, Army Index Russian Manpads. The Army which has been looking for new man portable air defense systems has inducted a small number of IGLAS. IGLAS systems are Russian systems. So what are manpads? These are manpads. So here it's given okay uh, it has inducted a small number of glass systems recently procured from russia under emergency procurement now what is emergency procurement emergency procurement is 
it is the procurement done through the vice chief's emergency financial powers given to the services for the first time after balakot air strike and further extended after the chinese uh, clash in galwan under this the services can procure weapons up to 300 crores on an urgent basis without any further clearances so that is known as emergency procurement while we have gone for emergency procurement for now a larger contract for the igla systems under the very short range air defense system deal is still pending and is under review by the defense ministry now why is this pending still this pending because india had floated a tender for which we had kept the limit at 2 billion dollars for procurement of man pads okay but the russian bid that got selected had only quoted a price of 1.47 billion dollars okay and hence there is a big difference between what india is offering to pay and what russia has only asked for so the government is trying to analyze again and so because of this analysis approval of the deal is taking a lot of time okay now the request for proposal of v shorad was issued in 2010 for 5000 missiles five contenders responded and eventually three made it to the trials mbde of france rosoboron export of russia saab of sweden okay and out of these it was the russian uh, man pad called iglas which was declared as the lowest bidder now first of all please remember that in order to acquire any weapon or any system it needs approval of the defense acquisition council in india now this defense acquisition council is actually headed by the chair uh, minister of defense okay it is headed by the minister of defense also the defense acquisition council is the highest decision making body in the defense ministry for deciding on new policies and capital acquisitions for all the three services and indian coast guard please remember this all three services plus the indian coast guard okay now this uh, defense acquisition council was formed after uh, the Kargil war in 1999 after the Kargil war happened India went for formation of defense acquisition council so that we can go for faster procurement of things that are needed okay next topic at 1.42 lakhs march gst haul is the record okay gst revenue collected in march 2022 stood at more than 1.42 lakh crores which is the highest since the introduction of gst GST revenues in March were 15% higher to GST of March 2021. Okay, of the 1.42 lakh crores, central GST was around 25,000 crores, state GST was around 32,000 crores, but it was the interstate GST, which means components produced in one state but being sold in another state, which is at 74,000 crores, and CES was around 9,400 crores. Okay. so it can be said that igst is usually the higher component when it comes to gst okay now what are the reasons for high gst collection it's because of the economic recovery from covid and aviation activities taken up by the government and usage of technology in preventing the fraud of uh, gst you know a lot of uh, people they keep generating fake invoices in order to claim input tax credit and hence government is evolving new technologies in order to take out these fake uh, invoices also there has been rate rationalization which is taken up by the gst council to correct the inverted duty structure okay now inverted duty structure is when the inputs or the raw materials they are charged at a higher uh, tax rate as compared to the final finished products now what is gst we have discussed this ample number of times please go through what gst is we have also discussed what the gst council is under article 279a 
uh, okay what it comprises of and all of that okay now I'm not going to discuss uh, GST again over here I'm going to leave it for you to do it however one important thing is that some of these taxes do not get sub subsumed under GST these are basic customs duty social welfare surcharge national calamity contingency duty excise duty and state VAT on production refining of crude oil petrol uh, diesel aviation turbine fuel and natural gas on all these things GST cannot be applied so these are outside the purview of GST also state excise on production and sale of liquor on that also GST can't be levied electricity duty road tax on vehicles road and infrastructure cess health cess all these are outside the ambit of GST and hence they can still be applied moving on CJ flags fa uh, falling credibility of the CBA please uh, make this flags now the CJ is not saying something new the CJ has been talking about the lack of credibility of the CBI for a very long time. In fact, in the Vineet Narayan case, the Supreme Court called the CBI as a caged parrot, which talks the words taught to it by its political masters. Okay. Now, The Chief Justice of India, N.V. Ramana, said that the CBI has come under deep public scrutiny. Its actions and inactions have raised questions regarding its credibility. Hence, in order to remove this, CJI has proposed an umbrella independent and autonomous investigating agency. Okay, what is the Central Bureau of Investigation? It was set up in 1963 by a resolution of the Ministry of Home Affairs. Now the CBI comes under the Department of Personnel and Training under the Ministry of Personnel and Public Grievances and Pensions. CBI derives power to investigate from the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act. So please remember there is no CBI Act like how there is a CVC Act. And hence uh, the CBI has to derive power from the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act. Okay, This establishment of CBI was itself recommended by the Santanam Committee. Okay, now what are the challenges which are faced by CBI? Okay, there is a lot of political interference and uh, the Supreme Court itself had said this on multiple times. Okay, it has often been used by the government of the day to cover up the wrongdoing, keep coalition allies in line and political opponents at bay. Thus it is doing the bidding of its master. Also there are overlapping agencies. There are several agencies which take up one single incident. Okay, this leads to dilution of evidence, contradiction in depositions, prolonged incarceration of innocents, which means that innocents are jailed for a longer period of time. And also there is a, a reduction of the evidence because one will be contradicting the other. Okay. What are the other problems? Acute shortage of personnel. A major cause of the shortfall is the government's sheer mismanagement of the CBI's workforce through a system of inefficient and inexplicably biased recruitment policies. And also the CBI, it comes under the Department of Personnel. Okay, So it can only go for hiring as many people as the DOPT allows. Thus, the CBI is extremely dependent upon the DOPT for everything. Okay. Now, Limited powers. The powers and jurisdiction of the members of the CBI for investigation are subjected to the consent of the state government. If the state government withdraws consent, then the CBI cannot do anything. Okay. So the CBI can only go for investigation and prosecution if either the judiciary has allowed it or if the states have given something known as a general consent. Okay. Okay, if the general consent is withdrawn, then the CBI cannot go and investigate cases in that state. Also, prior approval by the central government is needed in order to conduct inquiry. 
of employees of the central government of the level joint secretary and above okay so thus so many permissions are needed permission from the state government permission from the central government so there is no flexibility in the functioning of cbi apart from this the agency is also dependent upon the home ministry for staffing since many of its investigators come from indian police service okay dependent on home ministry also okay apart from this the agency depends upon the law ministry for lawyers in order to take up uh, i'm sorry prosecution so thus it needs support from the law ministry also from the home ministry also from the dopt also okay also since the cbi is actually run by ips officers it is always going to bend to the will of the central government so whichever party is in power in the central government automatically uh, their word will be carried out by say ips officers or by anything because ips officers no they look for their future postings so they will be given this lucrative deal that you will get posting in wherever you want if you do our things the way we want them to be done okay no also uh, since uh, law and order and police are state subjects and the cbi acts as the as per the procedure prescribed by the code of criminal procedure which makes it a police agency the cbi needs the consent of the state government in question before it can make its presence in that state and this is a cumbersome procedure okay now moving on how can law enforcement be improved so the uh, cji has said that you can go for the creation of an independent umbrella institution and he says that various central agencies like the cbi the enforcement directorate serious fraud investigation office all of them they can be brought under one roof however this organization should be headed by an independent and impartial authority who is selected by a committee okay now the cji also said that one additional inbuilt safeguard is to have a separate and autonomous wings for prosecution and investigation okay with the police and public order under the state list and the burden of investigation is primarily on the state police the proposed central law for umbrella investigative body can be suitably replicated in the states also since law and order is under the states so it is necessary that this this current umbrella organization also has to be established at the state level in order to ensure better enforcement of law and order also you can uh, bring about the criminal justice reforms we were talking about the criminal justice reforms as given by the malimath committee and as given in the prakash singh case where the supreme court has given several guidelines to be followed in the case of appointment and transfer of police officers okay malimath committee it supports inquisitorial justice system okay and uh, several other justices Uh, several other uh, modifications in the criminal justice system please uh, revisit one of the older videos in order to recollect it that's it thanks